Hi, good evening. This is uh, Glenn Newell from the San Jose Astronomy Association, and um, welcome to the first of my uh, online live uh, workshops for astroimaging. We're normally out at um, Little Uvis Open Space Preserve. You can see uh, a picture of it here. And uh, I kind of miss my my horse buddies and, and whatnot. And uh, we normally start uh, just at sunset. And I give a, uh, a lecture on usually all uh, overview of different types of uh, astroimaging and uh, then go into a, a demo once it's dark enough to see Polaris and get polar aligned and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, but tonight is going to be a, a different presentation. Uh, I'm going to focus specifically on deep space astroimaging, which is near and dear to my heart. And we'll talk about uh, what deep space astroimaging is and uh, what's in store for tonight in a few slides. But first, uh, oh, also, um, we have uh, Rashi is from uh, SJAA is going to help me watch the YouTube for questions. And a little later on, uh, Bruce, who runs the Imaging uh, Special Interest Group, will also be joining. And uh, he's going to be helping me uh, demo some equipment and software and whatnot uh, after we're done with the slides. So let me. Uh, go to the but first. Here's a little uh, blurb about uh, SJAA. Let me get my camera out of the way here. In this uh, presentation, I've tried to include. Uh, whoops, switched off the wrong thing there. Tried to uh, include QR codes wherever there's URLs so you can point your smartphone and click uh, rather than trying to write down URLs that aren't clickable in the in the YouTube stream. So, um, San Jose Astronomical Association, SJAA. We have two main uh, ways to see what's going on with us. One is the sja.net website. And then the other one is uh, we use meetup.com slash sj-astronomy is where all our public facing events are scheduled. And you probably know that because that's how you RSVP'd for, for this. But you'll see there that, that we're a uh, super active club with lots of things going on, which include, uh, oh, here's um, on the left is what our website looks like. And uh, you know there's tabs with resources across the top. And then on the right, we have the, the meetup. And new this month, due to the whole COVID thing, uh, we're starting to have a lot of online content. So uh, there's four different YouTube channels at the moment. We'll work on maybe consolidating things. But you know, my, my personal channel is where I've been posting pre-COVID uh, stuff. Uh, so that's the first one here, and that goes back to the days when I was just starting the hobby with uh, DSLRs uh, and um, smaller scopes and all that sort of stuff. And then there are the general SJA website, I'm sorry, uh, YouTube channel, um, where you'll find this presentation uh, when it's over and additional things that uh, I've helped with the streaming on. And then we've got a couple other uh, sites of the Cosmos uh, channel where um, basically the intro to the night sky and uh, sites of the Cosmos uh, talks are going to be held. And then uh, Solar Sunday has its own channel at the moment too. So those are the live online channels. So SJA does does a ton of stuff. You know, we're a nonprofit organization, and um, let me click on my small camera here. Get the mouse on the right screen. Okay. 
So we do in-town star parties at Hoagie Park in, in San Jose. We have the Quick Start program to help people get started in the hobby and find out if they're interested and what they're interested in before they go and spend money. Uh, we have a telescope loaner program, which also helps with that same type of thing. Uh, we do school star parties, and we also have uh, monthly speakers uh, right after our, our board meeting at Hoagie Park, and those are, those are now online as well. Click. Uh, Intro to the night sky classes. We have a library on site at Hoagie Park with astro books, including astro imaging. Besides my program, which is more hands-on uh, imaging, we also have the imaging special interest groups, which meets roughly on third Tuesdays of the month, uh, where we have speakers uh, regarding astro imaging and or group discussions and, and share techniques and whatnot. Uh, this is the astro imaging workshops and field clinics part is what I do. And then, um, okay, I think just a second, I think I need to do something here to let Bruce into the meat. Uh, yes, admit. Hey, Bruce. Hey. How are you doing, Glenn? Okay, I was just doing the uh, SJAA commercial slides, so I'm gonna jump back into that. Oh, okay. All right. Sorry to interrupt. No worries. Thanks for joining. Yeah, I'm gonna duck out. Actually, just you know, I'll stay connected, but I'm gonna take care of my connections on the other end here. Okay. Thanks, right. Bruce. No worries. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and. Uh, Going on with the SJA activities, we partner with the Open Space Authority to get access to some of their great sites for nighttime activities. Uh, for instance, my events without COVID being involved are, are at Little Uvis OSP, as I mentioned. Uh, and then we have dark site star parties at Rancho Canada de Oro, uh, which is one of their open space sites. Uh, we do have swap meets a couple times a year, which is fun. Good way to, to buy and sell astro gear. We have solar observing uh, once a month on Sunday at uh, Hoagie Park. That same uh, Sunday, we have fix-it sessions. If you've got a problem with your scope, you can come in and get advice or get help to get it fixed. And then uh, the club does a number of, uh, for, for members, uh, not for the general public, we have private viewing slash imaging from dark sites uh, from the OSP and, and uh, uh, other places. And all of this you get for just $20 a year. So it's a great, um, it's a great deal, I think. So let's move on. And clicked a few too many times here. All right, tonight's agenda. So as I mentioned, uh, normally I do a lecture that covers kind of all aspects of nighttime sky photography, which might be nightscapes, uh, star trails, time lapse, or somewhat you know wider fields of the, of the sky. Uh, and it, it's a lot of material to cover, and I've covered it a bunch of times, and it's available online. So tonight, uh, I want to focus on specifically on um, deep sky astrophotography. And as part of that, I wanted to start by talking a little bit about light pollution and how we can deal with that, because it's an ever-growing problem. I want to talk about what do I mean when I talk about deep space? And I want to talk about uh, the hobby challenges and then the solutions that we can help bring to be successful in your hobby. And we'll go into a little bit deeper on uh, rig design and try not to get too deep in the weeds, but it's, it's a little hard to, to avoid, but we'll see how we do. And then uh, we'll talk about uh, the hardware that, that Bruce and I will be using tonight. And we'll talk about the 
uh, software stack or the combination of software that Bruce and I will be using tonight. They're, they're different just as our rigs are different. And then we'll do uh, a live demo of actually, you know, taking some astro images. Uh, and as part of that, I'll be also demoing uh, some live stacking, uh, which you might do if you wanted to share astro imaging with an, with an audience uh, in, a, in a quicker way than your typical long exposure astrophotography, which is what we'd normally do for deep space. And uh, there'll be a couple other things uh, thrown in along the, along the journey here, but let's get, let's get started. So light pollution. So I live in Union City, which you know is a suburb of the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, right here where this pin is, and this is what's known as a white zone, which is the worst light pollution uh, on the scale, right? It's pretty bad. Uh, and so how do we how do we deal with that? And and you know being I, I choose to image from here uh, because I can have a semi-permanent setup and uh, image from my, my office in the house and image while I sleep and all that good stuff. And my rig's too big to really haul around anyway. But, uh, you know, I choose to do that despite all this light pollution. Uh, and so how do, we, how do we deal with that? So there's a, there's a couple things. Let's start with narrowband filters. So before LEDs, unfortunately LEDs are, are broadband, but before LEDs, uh, man-made light tended to be in very discrete uh, bands of, of light, uh, sodium vapor, mercury vapor, neon, uh, etc. And uh, so it was easy to make light pollution filters, which I'll show in a minute, uh, which sort of notch out a lot of that stuff but now we have LED lights which are which are broad spectrum and hopefully they'll meet their uh, design goals of pointing down at the ground and not so much up at the up at the sky and not lighting more uh, than they need to but uh, coming back here to narrowband filters so I uh, generally like to image nebulae and uh, and that can be done with, with narrowband filters. And so that's where filters are just notched out to cover these narrow uh, bands of, of light that are emitted by emission nebulas and to some extent reflection nebulas. So there, these bands of light are called hydrogen alpha, uh, singly ionized sodium, which is called S2, and doubly ionized oxygen, which is called O3. And then there's one or two objects that are that are hydrogen beta, but uh, for the most part, imagers use just these three bands. And then the the lighter colors here are uh, what your your RGB red, green, and blue filters would would look like. And they try to put these notches. Uh, or at least this one here, where some of that sodium vapor, mercury vapor stuff might be. Uh, although you'll see that that oxygen three is sort of smack in between uh, your red and your blue filters. So we use these again for these false color uh, images that you see. The the Hubble palette is the iconic uh, name for that. Uh, although there's lots of variations of what you can do to make uh, artsy colors. Um, um, and so you assign, you take, you know, a monochrome camera with these uh, filters and then you assign them red, green, or blue in any combination that, that looks good to you. Uh, I wanted to bring in, here's, if we overlay this, uh, here's what a light pollution filter might look like. So this is if you are got a color camera, for instance. Uh, and you're not going because you have a color camera. You're not going to be doing narrow band, and we'll talk about that in, in a little bit. Uh, but you could use a light pollution filter, which again is trying to notch out some bands where you might have undesirable light versus light from the sky, which is again these these uh, tend to be these nebula bands. Okay. Um. 
I was just glancing at the YouTube there. Don't see any questions yet. Feel free to, free to chime in with, with questions. The other thing that you can do from uh, light pollution uh, is, is be patient and collect lots of data. So yes, it's not going to be, you know, you go to a dark site and image for 45 minutes and come away with some data that you're going to then process. That's not going to happen from a light pollution uh, area, but you can get the same end results uh, by just increasing the total exposure time. So my rule of thumb now for, for here in Union City is um, 10 hours of integration per filter. I try to get to that point before I even try to process anything. And yes, that might be, uh, you know, like 45 minutes or an hour or something equivalent from a, from a dark site. Uh, but again, the, the upside for me is with automation, you know, I can I can sleep while my rig does the does the work, and uh, so patience does pay off. So as just as an example here, here's one of my images. So this is uh, the Eagle Nebula M15, and it contains, uh, if you look closely right here in the center you might recognize the Pillars of Creation, which is a fam famous uh, Hubble shot. In fact, let's take a look. So there's the Hubble shot right there next to mine. And, uh, you know, not too shabby if I <laughs> do, do say so myself. If you blow this up, of course, the Hubble is, is much more detailed because uh, the Hubble doesn't have to deal with... with uh, the scene in the atmosphere, which we'll talk a lot about tonight. Uh, so it's crystal sharp. And also, you know, it's got a 2.4 meter mirror and I've got a 12 inch mirror. So anyway, uh, but I can do, I can't operate the Hubble from my, uh, from my office, but I can operate my rig. So, all right. So what do we mean by deep space uh, when we talk about astro imaging? So, what we mean is galaxies and nebulae for the most part, and I guess I should include globular clusters. Um, so those are deep space objects versus, say, uh, you know, Milky Way shots or um, some of the some of the bigger nebulae. Even I wouldn't put in this category. You know, I would call it wide field, like the North American Nebula or the California Nebula. Or some of the the uh, H2 regions um, are bigger. Some of the dark nebulas are bigger, um, but you know galaxies and uh, bright emission and reflection nebulae are what we mean by deep space. Uh, unfortunately, in terms of the overall hobby of nighttime photography, you know it, it's going to be the most expensive. It's going to be the most complex. It's going to be the most mechanically sensitive, and we'll kind of hit this point uh, again and again. Uh, and that kind of drives what, what makes it so fiddly, right? And there's because of all those things interacting, there's lots of failure points. Uh, and uh, so you just, you just deal. So multiple software and hardware working together. You know, we typically have some planetarium software, uh, mount driver software, autofocus, image capture, plate solver, auto guiding, and then we want to automate all of the above so we can do things like meridian flips and and uh, multiple targets and and uh, image image all night. Um, so as a couple examples here of galaxies and, and nebulae, uh, these are both uh, taken from a robotic scope in Sighting Springs, Australia, that's pictured on the underneath my camera here. Let me turn that off for a minute. Um, and so on the left, we have uh, the Helix Nebula, which is one of the, you know, to me, most amazing objects in the sky because it looks just like a human eye with an eyelid and, and everything. It's kind of spooky. But there it is. Uh, so also called God's Eyes uh, Nebula. And that's a, a false color image in the, in the Hubble palette. You'll see it in a, in a lot of different uh, 
a lot of different uh, colors arrangement, uh, but this is the one that, that I did. And then on the right, uh, this is a, a Southern Hemisphere uh, Galaxy Centaurus A, and that's an example of uh, LRGB. So again, a monochrome camera, but with luminance red, green, and blue filters versus the God's Eye Nebula, which was done in narrow band, hydrogen alpha, sulfur two, and oxygen three filters. Okay, let me cover my footnote here. Um, I can turn my camera back on. So the the footnote, there we go. The footnote says, if you hold a golf ball nine kilometers away from your eye, it covers an arc second of sky. Okay, so keep that keep that in mind as we go through the slides here, and I'll explain why that's important and what an arc second is, and and all of that. But that's really driving what you know makes this this hobby uh, so so fiddly um, is that arc second. Okay. Um. So to go a little bit more into the, the challenge of deep, deep space astrophotography, right? So up here on the, on the left, we sort of have the minimalist, uh, you know, put a camera on a telescope and call it good. And uh, don't get me wrong, uh, you can start that way. And there are people uh, that get very excellent images uh, with not much more equipment than just that. Uh, we have a, a Francesco, excellent uh, imager, one of the best image processors I've seen. Uh, he uses a, a DSLR and a small refractor and uh, an intervalometer and a mountain and uh, a, a standalone auto guider, and that's about it. And, uh, uh, but that's um, most, when I talk about, you know, deep space astrophotography is a hobby, what most people are doing is more like this bottom picture here, right? So they're hanging a lot of gear uh, on their mounts and they're automating everything. Uh, and what what that ends up being is, uh, you know, you're sort of a Jack or Jill of, of all trades, right? So you're you're an amateur astronomer. You're, uh, you need patience and perseverance because all this stuff has to work, you know, together. You need to know a little bit about optics. You need to know a little bit about mechanics. You need to know a little bit about electronics. You've got to use computers and software. Uh, if you're also into do-it-yourself stuff, you can go nuts with uh, 3D printing and Adreno, uh, Arduino, sorry, projects and similar. Uh, and then there's also some some artistry involved when you get into the image processing. So for me as a, as a Silicon Valley uh, engineer, it's kind of like the perfect storm of a lot of different things that I like to do. Uh, so that's where I got uh, sucked into the, into the hobby. So those are the challenges, but you know what? Uh, we're here to help, right? So SJA is here to help. So uh, we've got you know, a community of astro imagers uh, that hang out on a mailing list slash Google group. Uh, that's for club members. We do have the fix it session I mentioned before. We have workshops and SIG meetings. Uh, and then we're starting to have these online resources. And then we've got the, uh, there's a typo here. It's supposed to say field clin clinics, uh, private imaging observing for club members only, right? So you can go hang with your club buddies uh, at a dark-ish site. Uh, and uh, do imaging and help each other out. And that's typically what happens is you learn from each other and, and help each other out at these private uh, events. Okay. All right, let me move my camera out of the way again. So why not just uh, camera and, and telescope? What What is the reason that you need to go more complex than that well first of all your your terrestrial camera or daytime photography camera is going to be a color camera which means it's got what's called a bayer matrix uh, of filters in front of the sensor so every four pixels 
has uh, one red, one blue, and two green filters in front of those four pixels. And that limits uh, what you can do. It makes it difficult to do narrow band uh, because there's already color filters in the way. Um, and uh, another issue with daytime cameras is that they typically have a large part of the IR filtered out. Uh, and all of this has to do, you know, why are there two green pixels and why is the IR filtered out? And all that has to do with trying to match the camera sensors to the color reproduction of the of the human eye. But if you think about, you know, when we're trying to do deep space astrophotography, we're, we've already sort of abandoned the human eye as, as not the effective tool. And so we're, we're trying to see things like hydrogen alpha, uh, which is pushed into the, into the IR part of the spectrum that gets filtered out by these terrestrial cameras. Uh, also, uh, you know, certainly with the new mirrorless cameras, the camera companies have made a decision to put them in the market without so much of the ability to control them remotely with computers. It's not a technical challenge. It's something they decided to do to position them in the market versus a more expensive DSLR. Now, there are newer softwares that have sort of back-ended or reverse-engineered or figured that out. Uh, but but for the most part, uh, you know, the commercial astro imaging programs aren't going to work with with mirrorless cameras, even though those are very excellent cameras in terms of taking pictures of the of the night sky. Uh, good news is we can we can build those same sensors from those cameras into dedicated astro cameras. But I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit here. So the next thing is, uh, you know, these cameras are, are not cooled. And cooling uh, makes a huge difference in the amount of noise that you see when you take images of the, of the sky at night. Um, you know, there's something like a doubling of noise for every five degrees uh, centigrade of, uh, of temperature that you can cool the sensor to. So typically, you're going to run your dedicated astro camera at um, minus 15, minus 20, or sometimes even down to minus 40 uh, degrees below ambient uh, temperature. And uh, that makes a big difference in the amount of noise in, in your image. The other thing that I would note uh, is, you know, when you buy a, a terrestrial camera, you know, every year there's more and more megapixels and it's supposed to be better. Well, it's better for, you know, daytime imaging and it's you know now you can do 4k or even 6k video with these things um, but none of that really helps with nighttime photography of the sky because what's really limiting your your resolution is the roiling of the atmosphere you know if you look up at the moon uh you know it sort of fades in and out of focus or you know royals and that's the that's an example of the, what's called the scene and we'll talk we'll talk more about that um but there are some mitigations you know for some of these restrictions that we just that i just talked about right so there are for color cameras there are uh two or three different manufacturers doing either tri-band or dual band filters that are sort of like super light pollution filters that that try to cut down and just show you uh, the bands again of the nebulae but it's um, going to be a little bit different because of the you know the oxygen 3 being right between green and blue they can't split that out into another color like you would uh, with a narrow band and monochrome camera, um, but they do have that. And then uh, back in the day <laughs> when CCD cameras were very expensive and all there was in terms of dedicated astro, uh, some people uh, did take uh, DSLRs and modify them. And one of the modifications was to chemically remove that Bayer matrix and uh, a lot of cameras got ruined and uh, you often had um, sensors with some dead rows or something, but you could do that. I, I had a Nikon uh, that I bought that somebody had modified like that and used it for several years. Um, and then, 
you know, there's IR modifications where some uh, the the IR filter is removed completely and uh, either replaced with a, a lesser uh, strict uh, IR filter or optical glass, and exactly what IR modification is done to the camera kind of affects both its its nighttime performance and whether or not it can still be used for daytime and do things like autofocus and stuff. Um, and I mentioned that you know some of the newer software does work with mirrorless cameras, but in the, in the beginning the mirrorless cameras just weren't going to work. And then of course there's there's do-it-yourself cooling projects. So you could build a a cooler for your for your DSLR to cool it down. I uh, messed around with that in the beginning. I had uh, water cooled both a water cooled Canon and a water cooled Nikon uh, on my rig at one point. Um, and then of course you could cool electronically as well. And uh, if you're going to go with with DSLRs, I advise people you know don't don't worry about modifying your your DSLR you just spent you know seven eight thousand dollars on uh, seven or eight hundred or a thousand dollars on keep that for daytime use and because of this uh, seeing effect you know a, a Canon T3 or a Canon T3i or a Nikon D5100 you know those older cameras are all you need and uh, you can buy those already astro modified you know with this ir modification all day long for three or four hundred bucks on on uh, ebay or what have you um, just check the shutter count uh, other than that you should be good to go but then the you know the big reason why not to do that is today uh, now we have cooled cmos astro cameras so people have taken these same CMOS sensors that were designed for DSLRs and they're making them into uh, they're buying them without the Bayer matrix manufactured in place and they're making them in, or with if in the case of one shot color but for deep space for me uh, monochrome cameras and they make them into these cooled uh, astro cameras you can see the heat sink here and there's a fan on the back that does the cooling and all the camera electronics and, and the sensor are up in this front part here. Uh, and they're relatively inexpensive compared to uh, CCD astro cameras of, of the past. Okay. Uh, the other thing, uh, you know, that's driving just a, a camera and a, a small refractor on, a, on an inex inexpensive tracking mount is uh, you know, working towards improved tracking. So the, you know, the stars appear to move in the sky because the Earth rotates. Um, let me pop myself back on here. And uh, so we need to track the stars or the objects across the sky. And, uh, you know, it takes good uh, mechanics to do that accurately. That's getting back to that arc second accuracy again, which will hit again and again. So better mounts and sky models are uh, a reason for that. Improved tracking and auto guiding is going to um, help you get that much more accurate. So auto guiding, you know, the, the mechanics of the mount are going to track at a certain rate and that's it. But the the uh, so there's going to be some inaccuracies due to gears and dirt and gre in the grease and whatnot in your in your mount. Uh, but with auto guiding, you can correct for that by having a typically a second camera and potentially a second even a separate separate telescope uh, connected to your mount. Like see right here, this guy's got a. a a guiding scope on top of his main telescope. So he's got a guiding camera and an imaging camera. So the auto guider will look at a star and just focus on that one star and see how it appears to move relative to the camera frame and it'll send corrections to the mount to speed up or slow down uh, to keep that uh, perfectly centered. You know, back in the days, uh, astronomers used to ride up in the cage of, of their teles the big telescopes 
and with a joystick uh, manually with their eye glued to a you know a, a finder scope uh, and manually keeping st the star on the on the crosshair so today we have we have auto guiding software to do that for us uh, also auto focus so you know with this rig up here i mentioned you know you could get focused uh, with the aid of a batten off mask or something at the beginning of the night and you'd be good to go for a while but what happens is the temperature changes as the as things cool off and so that means things shrink and so that actually changes your your focus point uh, and so you would have to keep focusing periodically over the night uh, so you'd have to go slew away from your object to a bright star and refocus and then slew back to your target or what have you uh, but with autofocus that all goes away and it's managed for you and uh, can be adjusted um, you can either figure out what your focus varies with temperature and just have it take care of that for you or you could say i want to auto focus every few minutes or every so many degrees of temperature change or with every filter or change or what have you um, so that's just part of the this whole automation that we'll talk about next here right so we want to automate everything so that we can do things like uh, you know all night imaging uh, so when I first started in this hobby, again, DSLR, uh, great DSLR control program, Backyard EOS or Backyard Nikon, uh, you know, I could I could track an uh, object across the sky up to the meridian, which is the, you know, the, the zenith, if you draw a line, the high point in the sky. Uh, and then I'd have to shut things down uh, unless I wanted to stay up and manually do that meridian flip uh, to come back around through Polaris and, and back the other way. And that has to do with German equatorial mounts, which, which I don't really cover in this uh, talk, but all of the, the astro imaging mounts, or let's say 95% of them are German equatorial mounts. They can't uh, cross the the meridian directly. They have to go back through Polaris and come at it from the from the other side to avoid banging the camera. If you've got a long refractor, banging the camera into the mount leg or something. So without uh, if you're going to sleep through that meridian flip, you need a bunch of automation, right? Because you need to uh, you know stop tracking, turn off the auto guider. Uh, you know, slew, do the do the meridian flip, come back around, get back on your target, turn the auto guiding back on. You know, maybe check the autofocus because you had mirror flop or or something. You know, so all of that uh, doing a meridian flip is a is a complicated operation that that can be done with automation. Uh, also, multiple targets, right? So you might want to do four or five targets. Uh, during a night and you can do that with with automation uh, all while you sleep uh, this is a picture of my current rig or some of my current rig anyway uh, here on the right and we'll talk more about that but uh, this is a, a 12 inch uh, Richie Kreitschen re re reflector and uh, like I said we'll we'll talk more about All right, so we're going to go try to not go too deep in the weeds here, but we're going to talk a little bit about designing a deep space astro imaging system. So first thing point that I always make to people is. OK, and it looks like my stream is hung. There we go. Come on. Yeah, right. just turn it back up again. Okay, not sure how much time did we did we lose? Just, just um, a maybe second. about three, two, two or three seconds. Okay, all right. Oh, well, I must have neighbors streaming Netflix or something. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I was saying uh, the first point that that I want to make, you know, about an astro imaging system. You know, well, you're probably thinking, oh, well, what telescope and what camera? But that's really not the first thing you want to think about. The most important thing is the mount. It's all about the mount. And this is where we come back to this 
you need this arc second accuracy, right? So if you need something that's as accurate as the width of a golf ball nine kilometers away from you, you know, you can imagine that that's not going to be, uh, you know, cheap commodity hardware, right? It's going to be a precision piece of, of engineering. Um, and, and again, we'll, we'll keep hitting that. Um, so that's, that's uh, the most important thing. And there's a, sort of a rough rule of thumb, you know, if your overall budget you think you're going to spend on this hobby is, is less than, say, 10K, then you, you're probably going to want to spend about 70% of your budget on the mount. Um, you know, if you're going to spend more than 10K, and people, people do, uh, you know, then maybe it's like 50% on the mount. But, the, you know, the mount should be the first thing you pick and the most important thing uh, because your hobby is going to be so much easier and so much enjoyable if you're not fighting the mount to get good tracking and to get round stars, to get good guiding. It's just so much more enjoyable with a quality, quality mount. The other thing that I think uh, tends to happen uh, is, you know, you buy a small beginner mount and it may be okay for your small beginner telescope, but then when you want to upgrade, you not only are going to be upgrading your telescope, but you're also going to have to upgrade the mount because the payload, it might be accurate enough, but the payload capacity isn't going to be enough uh, as you as you move up. So, you know, buying buying a mount once instead of buying it again and again, you know, is, is another uh, strategy. And then, um, you know, the different different manufacturers, I'm not uh, trying to single out Orion here or anything, but that's, we have, uh, Orion is here local to us in this part of California. Uh, and so I have a lot of experience with the different Orion slash Skywatcher slash Cinta mounts, which are all OEM versions of the of the same thing. Uh, you know, the, the, the Atlas Pro, uh, is really the minimum mount that that I would recommend, and there's uh, you know the the capacity and some of the upgrades that that mount has, the belt drive, um, the saddle, the extra thick counterweight, et cetera, et cetera, uh, that you would have to add to a lesser mount, uh, you know, make make it a, a good package uh, deal, and so but you know spending or think about spending around two thousand dollars on a, on a mount as a as a minimum. Okay, quick. Glenn, I just want to quickly interject. Uh, yeah. Some people want to do like very wide field deep sky mm -hmm. and there are less expensive options if you're doing a DSLR with a, with a camera lens at this point. And that's a good way to start actually for a lot of people. So you might want to talk about that to start adventure. Okay. Yeah, I, again, uh, thanks Bruce. This this talk is mainly on the deep deep space stuff and we'll talk about fields of view and stuff in a, in a little bit here but yeah certainly for a, a dslr and a and a small refractor or like bruce said a camera lens there are less expensive ways to go which make it very portable and lightweight uh you know even no no counterweights maybe um but again, that that's limited with with what you can do, uh, you know, in terms of when you start to do galaxies and and nebulae. Okay, so let's move on to the telescope. Uh, so there's kind of two schools of of thought. Uh, one school of thought is, you know, hey, this hobby is hard enough. Let's not start with uh, a super long focal length. That's that's going to be fiddly. You know, let's start with a small, inexpensive refractor and have a wider field or even like bruce was saying a, a camera lens uh you know get you started in the hobby and see if you enjoy it or not before you you go bigger um so that's one school of thought and that's the advice that i got when i started which which i didn't take and i jumped right into uh rc's uh but you know to to, to each his own and so then i'd say the second 
uh, school of thought is, you know, go big or go home. So, you know, if I'm going to do this thing, I'm going to go all the way, right? So design for the, the maximum performance, uh, you know, again, depending on what your 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 goal is in terms of, of objects. Um, and so, you know, aperture is, is king. Uh, and the biggest aperture bang for the buck is going to be some type of reflector. And the most uh, popular ones for imaging are, are either RCs or SCTs. Now, we can talk about the variations of those and imaging Newtonians and, and whatnot. But uh, for, for my money, uh, RCs are the, are the biggest bang for the buck. And, and then uh, SCTs are, are quite popular as well. Um, that said, uh, you know, big refractors are less fiddly in terms of uh, something called collimation, you know, keeping all the optical components aligned. They're easier to, to operate uh, and maintain, but they do cost more uh, for the most part. And, uh, you know, they make beautiful images with no diffraction spikes. If you don't like diffraction spikes, then you get a big refractor. Um, so Bruce, uh, this is actually a picture of Bruce. Let me put my mouse on the right screen so you can see it here. This is actually a picture of Bruce's rig, which one of Bruce's rigs, which is a pretty much the the biggest amateur refractor, right? Is a 152 inch uh, triplet. Yeah, so that's an amazing scope. Okay, and then uh, there's also one other flavor that we can talk about that's uh, becoming kind of popular and it's pretty new actually. It's a variation on the on the Starzona Hyperstar modified SCTs, which which is the Celestron Raza. Bruce, what does that stand for again? Roy? Is it Ro? Ro Ackerman Schmidt something astrograph. Uh, Ro Ackerman. Ro Ackerman Schmidt astrograph. Hey, I I eventually fumbled my way around to that. Okay, That's great. Correct. Yeah. And, you know, uh, this is, you'll see the cameras on the front of this thing, which, which causes its own set of problems, right? You can't have a big filter wheel there. Uh, you got, you know, if you, how are you going to get your wires in and out of there without causing diffraction spikes you don't like or something, you know? So there's, and, and uh, it's, it's, so my thing is, it's like a race car, right? It's extremely high performance but it's also very fiddly, right? Very precise spacing and alignment and all that stuff to, to get that performance out of it. Um, might be, you know, is, I should say, a good, if you're gonna do one shot color, uh, you know, that's an awesome scope. Um, and they come in eight and 11 inches, but uh, if you're gonna do narrow band, right, then you're gonna be manually changing filters and, and there's some more stuff but if you want to get the maximum amount of data in the shortest amount of time uh there are there is that option these days right bruce <laughs> bruce has an 11 inch rasa too yes okay great <laughs> all right so this is where we go probably a little deeper in the weeds than than this lecture probably should but uh it's it's important uh right so matching the and OTA stands for optical t uh, telescope assembly, I believe. I, I knew that earlier today. Optical tube assembly. Yeah, optical, optical tube, tube assembly. assembly. Okay, yeah, I knew that earlier today and had since forgotten it. But yeah, because people just say OTA all the time. So matching your 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 telescope and camera. Uh, so we have to talk about some some concepts here to get the right uh, terminology. So. Everybody knows there's 360 degrees in a circle, but did you know there's 60 arc minutes in a degree? And did you know there's 60 arc seconds in an arc minute? So there's that dreaded arc second thing again that we know we need to be accurate to an arc second. Uh, so it's a 60th of an arc minute, which is a 60th of a degree. Okay, and we're gonna use those uh, uh, terms to define things like field of view and arc seconds per pixel in our camera. And those are terms that we're gonna use, again, to match uh, camera and uh, uh, optical tube assembly <laughs> together. 
Okay, and and going back to the visual side for a minute, just to kind of get you oriented again on on uh, sizes of things in the sky, right? So this is a, a cool chart uh, often used, right? So you're if you hold your fist up at arm's length, it it uh, covers about a 10 degree space of of the sky, right? So then we can go down to one degree with your pinky finger. And then from there, we're off into the arc minutes and, and arc seconds. And remember, we said the, the arc second uh, is a golf ball uh, nine kilometers out. And I've got another analogy for that as, as well. So when we come to then the field of view, this is, means, you know, what is your telescope going to be able to see on the sky? Um, so you kind of need to know, well, what is it? What are the sizes of things on the sky? Not in terms of light years uh, width or something, but because, you know, how they are on the sky depends on how far away they are, how close they are, not just on how big they are, right? So we're going to talk about um, the field of view of your telescope. And so the way I like to think about it are, again, focusing on deep space. You know, there's a few wide field objects uh, out there, right? And you think about Andromeda, the big nebula, uh, like, uh, you know, the, the rosette, the Cal I mentioned before, the North American nebula, the, uh, the California nebula, and some of the H2 regions and stuff are pretty big. Uh, so there's a, there's, a, there's a, you know, tens of those. Uh, and, as you go around the Milky Way, you can count. Maybe there's 20 or something. I don't know. Um, so there's a few of those. But most galaxies and bright nebulae are, you know, in tens of, of arc minutes. They're not degrees across. They're tens of arc minutes across. And then there's even smaller objects that you might want to image, a planetary nebula uh, and, you know, smaller galaxies, further away galaxies, tend to be less than, say, six arc minutes across. Um, so, you know, it's hard to say what people have, uh, but I'd, I'd say your typical deep space field of view might be 30 to 60 arc minutes across. So here's a couple examples. So, you know, on the wider side, this is kind of an iconic framing of M81 and M82, right? So you get two galaxies in one frame, and you're going to need about 60 arc minutes. You know, this is... 55 and change by 42 and change arc minutes uh, field of view here as shown in, in Stellarium against a uh, image of M81 and M82 by uh, Rob uh, File, uh, one of the, our uh, SJAA members. Uh, so that's, that's a typical size. And then here we have uh, on the smaller end of things, Another kind of iconic image of uh, uh, the Horsehead Nebula, and try to do this from memory, NGC 2023, maybe? Uh, one of my favorite nebulae there. Um, but that's, you know, this is uh, 31 and a half uh, by 24, say, say, arc minutes, right? So... Somewhere between those two is what you're you're typically going to want to shoot for to get most uh, deep space objects without having to do uh, mosaics or frames, you know, multiple frames of these to put together put together a picture. All right. Um, so then comes the more technical stuff, again, getting down to this uh, arc second per pixel. I just want to bounce back for a minute here. Okay. So again, we talked about on the surface of the Earth, uh, as opposed to like the Hubble Space Telescope, you know, seeing this roiling of the atmosphere limits our resolution. And the typical, it, seeing is measured in, in arc seconds. And typical amateur seeing, and by that we mean, you know, down on the on the ground or maybe a mountaintop, but not a carefully planned observatory site, right? Observatory sites are very carefully planned 
uh, not just to be high up in the air, but to have this laminar, lamellar, I pronounce that right, flow, smooth air flowing over the observatory site um, so as to have less of that roiling air. So they have better seeing than we do. Uh, typically, but for amateurs, it's typically around two arc minutes. Uh, I'm, that's a typo. Two arc. It should say two arc seconds. Uh, so therefore, uh, using sampling theory, the uh, what you need to do to get that maximum resolution in a photo would be to have one arc second per pixel. So one pixel on your camera would see one arc second of sky and so we go back to you know after a certain point more pixels don't help because you can't uh, get any finer resolution because of the of the scene so there's a couple things that that you can do about that because uh what what happens is modern sensors get have more and more pixels as the pixels get smaller and smaller and it becomes actually difficult with the modern CMOS cameras to to have even uh, you, you're always going to be uh, oversampling you're going to have you know like half an arc second per pixel or 0.4 or 0.3 or something so one of the things that astrophotographers typically do for deep space is they add a focal reducer uh, which can can help you get back more towards this one arc second per per pixel uh, rule of thumb, right? So it's going to lower the focal ratio ratio. It's going to widen your field of view, uh, but it will eat back focus. And back focus is where I drew the line on uh, this being beyond the, the the scope of the this particular lecture. But uh, basically, it's it just means that you you're going to run out of inward travel on your focuser and you can't come to focus uh, if you're if you're trying to get too much focal reduction with a focal reducer okay uh, i already talked about the the pixels are, are really small these days um, and so there's a number of ways to to calculate both the the field of view and the arc seconds per pixel so i've posted the the formulas here on the slide but you know that's the the hard way so there's lots of you know stellarium as a planetarium program can do this uh, there's lots of web pages and other online facilities calculators that can that can do these calculations for you um, there is an excuse me there's an older program called ccd calc uh, that's really nice and it also has like stellarium it'll show you the images um, of your your target you know what they look like in a in a field of view um, there's a um, one of the telescope simulator sites i forget which one there's probably more than one does a similar thing so you can you can try out different combinations of stuff there and we'll talk about another way in in a minute uh and then the other the other point I want to make here when considering cameras and stuff is, you know, sensor size really drives the cost, and it, it does so for like three or four reasons, right? So you can get a great AstroCam, and I'm referring here to the ZWO ASI 1600 as a super popular um, Astro camera, you know, for about thirteen hundred dollars. Um, but if you know you you go up to a crop sensor or all the way up to a full uh, frame you know a 35 millimeter uh, diagonal astro camera you know you're going to be paying 4k and and up for something like that uh, so just the cost of the camera you know goes up as you as you increase sensor size but there's some other you know effects that happen too so you need bigger filters right so you might get away with a one and a quarter inch or maybe 31 uh, millimeter filter for you know that four thirds inch sensor uh, but you know for a, for a crop sensor or a full frame sensor you might need a, a 50 millimeter filter so you can see just as one example for for a particular 
and there's another typo. Uh, 5 nanometer HA 1.25 inch is 460 bucks. So this was supposed to say 5 nanometer. Uh, oh, I see. 50, 50 millimeters, this should say. Uh, yeah, got it. 5 nanometers, 1.25 inch filter. This is 5 nanometers, 50 millimeters for that full frame sensor. You know, you jump from $460 to $725, but wait, you know, you need six or seven filters to cover, you know, the RGB and the narrow band and everything. So that can really multiply the cost of your of your rig. And and of course, you need a telescope that's going to produce an image circle at prime focus that is what we call flat uh, to that same width, right? So uh, it's one thing to make a telescope that makes a small image circle that's flat, but it's more uh, difficult and costly to produce, you know, a, a bigger flat image circle. So you're going to spend more on the OTA. You're going to need a larger focuser. If you're using a focal reducer, you're going to need a larger focal reducer flattener, and you're going to need larger filters. So all of those things are driven by this by the size of the sensor. So that's something to to keep in mind. Now, the, of course, the flip side is you get a huge field of view and uh, means you can image more without doing mosaics or what have you. But Okay. So the other way, another way to uh, look at field of view and actually just, you know, what Astro Gear works together and what can I do with it is to use Astro Bin. So Astro Bin is a great resource. It's very mildly sort of the Facebook for, for or let's say social media for, for um, imagers because you, you post their image there and then people can like it or, you know, unlike it or, and make comments, whatever. But, but what makes it a super great uh, resource, in, in my view, is you can search for types of equipment, right? So here you see I've searched for a Canon T3i, right? So it's giving me all images that were taken with a camera with a Canon T3i. So you could you could search, you know, what if I bought this RC and and an ASI 1600? What can I do with that? Uh, and what if I had a focal reducer or didn't have a focal reducer? So then you can search and see what people people are doing and and to a uh, also, uh, you know, they they have this technical card that tells you more details. Well, what filters did they use? How many exposures did they take? How long were they? Did they cool? Uh, what temperature did they cool to? And all of that, all that stuff. You can, you know, what was the arc seconds per pixel? Uh, all of that information is available here on on Astrobin. So that's a great resource. Uh, on the right is uh, uh, an older view of uh, my page um, but that's a that's a great that's a great resource to figure out what to buy okay um, did I jump past I did okay let me pop my camera back on here all right so again uh, Tonight we're going to be using a couple different rigs. My rig here in Union City is this 12-inch uh, RC truss. Again, the, the RC is the same optical design as the Hubble Space Telescope. It's um, the optical design that is used by most modern observatory telescopes. Although they, you know, they may have segmented mirrors or whatnot, but the, in general, they're this Ritchie. Uh, Crichton uh, design, optical design. Um, so that's that's the telescope, and you know it's it's sort of semi-permanent. I don't have a a pier set in concrete, but I have a a big pier set on a concrete pad. Uh, so that's my semi-permanent setup uh, for astrophotography. And you know, there's a underneath the the cover here on the on the on the pier there's a a local computer and a and a wi-fi rig and power supply and whatnot uh, so i can operate that from from the house uh, via wi-fi okay 
and if we zoom in a little bit here, uh, you know, I'll call this the the instrument package, right? And I, I started calling it that because I actually have a small refractor that I can take, you know, this whole section off and put it on the small refractor and do wider wider field stuff. But this is my instrument package. So, um, you know, there's a focuser here, and then I have uh, do it yourself uh, made that into a, a rotator with 3D printed parts and stuff. Uh, so you can see this this belt here and this 3D printed gear is part of the the rotator. So this whole instrument package can rotate around for diff so to rotate the field of view uh, on the sky. Okay, and then we have uh, the focuser and the focuser motor for for electronically focusing and buried in here between the focuser and the rest of this is is a focal re reducer uh, most of it's down inside the focuser uh, and then we have something called an, an on-axis guider so you may have heard of off-axis guider this is an on-axis guider so basically what it is is a what's called a cold mirror at a 45 degree angle and the reason it's called a cold mirror is the cooler wavelengths of light, namely visible light, come in here and bounce off that 45 degree mirror and go up through the filter wheel to the imaging camera. But the infrared, the hotter light, goes through the cold mirror and out here to another camera, to my guiding camera out the, out the back. And that lets us do some, some interesting things like uh, real-time autofocus, continually and also you have a uh, image circle for your guide scope that's the same size as your image circle for your imaging camera for your guide camera as for your imaging camera and that way you don't have to worry about uh, finding guide stars which is something that you might have to do if you have an off-axis guider okay and we just have a, a different camera angle here again showing uh, you know the some of the rotator stuff and the electronics for the rotator filter wheel and imaging camera okay uh, Bruce's rig again that 152 millimeter uh, stellar view refractor and uh, the, his is a portable rig and in the bucket down here at the bottom, he's got a, a computer and a Wi-Fi router. And then his uh, instrument package is, is pretty similar to mine, as it turns out. Uh, he has a commercial focuser and rotator combination, a Moonlight a night crawler. Um, and then he's got the same uh, focal reducer and the same on-ag uh, and it looks like uh, ZWO filter wheel and it's probably a ASI something ZWO camera on there. And then he has the the guide camera on the back of the the Onag. So that's a very similar uh, instrument package to what I'm I'm running. So Glenn, I do have a quick question for you. Yep. Uh, if you don't mind. Yeah. Uh, the, the the rotator uh, that you have for the entire package, do mm -hmm. you rotate to, uh, in between shots of the same object that you're taking, or is it only when you want to rotate the entire field of view and then take X number of shots? It's for framing the field of view per object. Per object. Yeah. Right. So it's not. So there's another type. You remember I talked about German equatorial mounts yes. are 95 percent of the imaging mounts well there you can use um alt azimuth mounts for mm -hmm. imaging but they suffer from something called field rotation so the the yep. the image appears to rotate as it moves across the sky and there's another type of rotator called a camera rotator that you can use to to correct for that and that that's not what this rotator is for um, this, this rotator is to uh, arrange the rectangular field of view correctly for, you know, framing, artistically framing the object uh, yeah, right. on the sky. So before that, uh, you know, I would, ha if I wanted to image multiple targets, uh, I'd have to go out there and, and manually 
rotate things and I'd be running back and forth from the house to the telescope, you know, mm -hmm. move it five degrees. Now, oh, you went too far, move it back three degrees, right? And the other thing that happens is with an on-axis or an off-axis guider, uh, as opposed to a separate uh, guide scope and camera, when you rotate that package, you manually you'd have to recalibrate your auto guider because you've now rotated how it relates to the mount and, and everything, right? The camera has, mm -hmm. has moved against the sky and the mount model and all that. But with a electronic rotator, it can keep track of and report, hey, I've now rotated 30 degrees and PHD2, the auto guiding software, will see that and compensate for it so you don't have to, to uh, uh, recalibrate. So that, that was a big Got motivator it. for me to, to build a, uh, a rotator. Awesome. Thank you, Glenn. Yep. Okay, let's move on, uh, and we're we're getting close, folks. We're getting close to the <laughs> to the to the demo. So hang with me a little bit further here. Uh, so let's talk about the software side of things for a minute. So uh, these days there are lots of choices. In fact, it's an embarrassment of of riches, I guess you would say. It it, it seems like there's a, just so many things I can't like try them all and see which one one is best you know it used to be in in my world view you know it was backyard nikon and backyard eos for dslrs and sequence generator pro for everything else uh and and there were more but th those were the big ones right but now you know you first of all you've got multiple platforms right you've got raspberry Pis. some people image with their smartphones or tablets You've got always had Windows. People want to use Macs. There's Linux. Uh, you know, so there's all these different platforms now. And you know, now there's free and open source or commercial software for doing all this stuff. And um, what's going to you know drive some of that? Those choices are going to be you know, are you going to do the the DSLR or mirrorless camera versus a dedicated astro camera? And what is the level of automation that, that you're going to try to achieve? You know, or did you just want to image up to the meridian and then stop? Or, or are you going to, uh, you know, stay up all night and do things manually? Or are you going to sleep and, and let it do its, do its automated thing? And then there's also the choice of, you know, point solutions versus all in one type of thing, right? So. Do you want to buy one program that's going to do it all or or even a free you know open source program that's going to do it all or do you need individual programs that are really super good at just their one or two or three tasks um, so just some of the some of the examples right so the in the free open source category uh, also multi-platform uh, you know we have k stars which actually has uh, k stars slash Ecos slash indie has a bunch of <laughs> bunch of names, but but that's you know it's an all-in-one runs on all platforms, open source, uh, you know runs on a Raspberry Pi, uh, you know so those those are uh, you can even buy it as an as an appliance that you know is going to run from your smartphone, right? ASI Air or uh, StellarMate would be examples of Raspberry Pis that come with K-Stars pre-installed. Uh, so that's one approach. Um, I mentioned the uh, Backyard EOS and, and Nikon, and uh, there's another popular one called APT, and that's the one that I think that has sort of reversed engineered the mirrorless cameras. I don't have any firsthand experience with that, but when I sit, when I tell people that mirrorless cameras can't be used, they they tell me that APT can can do it. So great. Uh, and then uh, you know, sort of the more traditional, uh, lots of automation uh, uh, examples would be you know, sequence generator I mentioned, uh, which I'll be demoing tonight. Uh, there's a newcomer uh, open source Nina that's very popular. Uh, Bruce is going to be for the for the first time, I think, using Voyager tonight. And uh, then there's 
uh, kind of a an oldie but a goodie, right? So the the professional observatories, the the itelescope.net and and telescope live and other things that are that are built to be remotely operated are probably running maxim dl and and acp um so but that's a a, a high dollar item compared to some of these other things but has more you know possibly more capabilities but there's many many more um so that's just a, an example um so what what do these things do right so i just made this up today right i had another deck that had you know six f's well this this one has has five <laughs> five f's in it so you know we're going to find objects in the sky so we're going to use a planetarium program we're going to use a mount driver to interface with the mount's internal model of the sky uh, or one one could argue that that you know that's all in the mount driver, but anyway, um, that's there. And uh, in some cases, you know, plate solve, which is uh, going to help us more accurately get on a target versus just what the mounts go to uh, accuracy is going to be, regardless of how well or poorly we pull or aligned, etc. Let mount leveling on and on. Okay. Uh, we're we're going to follow objects, right? So we're going to use the auto guider for that. And as I mentioned, that you know improves and works with the mount driver to more accurately track the objects as as they move across the night sky. We're going to focus on objects. So we talked about autofocus or electronically at a minimum electronically focus uh, versus run out to the telescope and manually turn a knob. Uh, we're going to control filters. So you've got, uh, you're either going to be doing LRGB or just RGB or narrow band, which is the HAS2 and O3 filters. So you have to, you know, manage all of that. And and then for the fifth F, I, I came up with film, film objects, which is, you know, you got to make sequences of exposures and filters to put this all together, right? So how many of of how long, exposures and of what filter uh, you know are going to make make my target image so those are the things that the, uh, that this software stack needs to do for you okay so what i'm going to be showing you tonight in terms of the software stack is i'm going to be using stellarium which is a free planetarium program I'm going to be using EQMod, which is a free mount driver for those Orion, Skywatcher, Cinta, uh, OEM flavors of, of uh, mount. Um, and I'll be using uh, Push Here Dummy version 2 <laughs> is the uh, auto guider software. Okay, PHD2 is how people usually say it. And uh, I'm also going to be doing a focus lock, although I will demonstrate uh, SGP doing autofocus. But focus lock is how, using that ONAG uh, device, how I continuously real-time focus all through the all through the night, and even during imaging, it's adjusting the the focus. Okay, and then uh, I'll be using sequence generator uh, to do everything else. Uh, and I will, on top of that, I'll be showing some uh, live stacking. And this was a, uh, something we put together to do um, the visual star party online flavor of our events. Uh, and so this was a, a way of getting a color image uh, up on the screen in a hurry, even though we've got mono, monochrome cameras with, with filters. So we'll talk about that. And that's, I've only found one piece of software that does that. It's called Astro Toaster. It's free and it works with another piece of free software called Deep Sky Stacker. So I'll show that as well. And then Bruce will be using uh, Voyager for the first time. Go Bruce. Uh, he'll be using, he's got a software BISC uh, mount so he'll be using the sky x which does a bunch of stuff he'll be using it as his planetarium as his mount driver and for doing the plate solving 
and he'll be using PHD2 like I do for auto guiding and he'll be using Voyager which is a, a commercial uh, program that's fairly new and it is supposed to be completely bulletproof uh, the guy that that writes this software is uh, a, a professional software engineer in the banking industry so he knows how to write software that is going to has to work no matter what so that's his uh, what he brings to the to the party here so bruce is going to be checking that out and uh, then we're going to just throw in uh, one or two other items here. So I'm just going to talk about Stellarium for a minute at the at the beginning, uh, because it's so much more than just the way I've been using it up until recently uh, as a planetarium to to uh, find targets in the sky for, and move my telescope. Uh, there's so much more that that you can do. It's really a planetarium like you would go to a planetarium and see a show it's that level of uh of uh tool and it's and it's free and it's multi-platform so i'm going to spend a few minutes talking about that and also just compare and contrast uh you know how you would use that as a visual observer versus how you would use that as an astrophotographer so maybe you know 10 minutes on that and then we'll dive in uh so i'll go through kind of the whole um setting up and, and imaging via you know my gear and software stack and then we'll we'll take a look at some live stacking uh, and then we'll switch over to bruce and he'll kind of do the same types of things with with uh, the software that we just talked about uh, for his rig all right yeah any other questions? Rob says he recognized one of his images. Yeah, it was his M81 and M82. That's one of the things that that you know I've done with Stellarium. And if you download Stellarium and you download the user guide and you look at Chapter 8, you'll you'll see my name because I wrote Chapter 8 and Chapter 8 or part of Chapter 8. Part of Chapter 8 is about putting your own images into Stellarium, or maybe there's an image you love off of Astrobin that's not yours, but you really love it. And so how to put those images in Stellarium accurately on the sky so that all the stars line up. And uh, when you go to look at, well, what does M81 and M82 look like in my field of view in Stellarium, you'll get, you know, Rob's image, should you choose, or, or your own. Um, so anyway, I did that a while ago, and that comes with uh, Python scripts and stuff to, to make that happen. Uh, but then recently, I've started curating a list of uh, SJAA Astro Imager photos and putting them in Stellarium. Uh, so far, we've got 68 deep sky objects in there, and I'll uh, probably keep, keep growing that. So it's just kind of fun to to go in Stellarium and see uh, somebody you know, uh, their image in there, uh, in that planetarium program. Uh, so, yep, all right. So let's dive into it here. Okay, so that's, that's gonna come later. Let me get out of the PowerPoint. And um, go to Stellarium. Okay, so this was uh, the way I set up Stellarium for uh, last night's armchair star party. And actually, another thing I want to mention about Stellarium is I've also added uh, landscapes. Uh, so, for instance, you know, SJA has a number of uh, places where we typically have star parties and private viewing events. So, for instance, here's uh, you know the the sidewalk at at Hoagie Park uh, in San Jose, uh, and that sidewalk points north. And this is where they do the in town star parties. So there's a a landscape for that, right? And then um, you know we were looking at RCDO a minute ago, uh, and what do we have? Uh, Coyote Valley. 
So this is where I used to do my workshops, and now we do the uh, binocular events from Coyote Valley Open Space Preserve. So you can see the horizon lines and uh, where you have hills in the way uh, or what have you. Right, and uh, I'll just do maybe... Anyway, little little Uvis is here. Uh, here's Mendoza Ranch. Uh, is another place that we do private viewing from uh, down in Morgan Hill, right? So these landscapes, uh, you know, have uh, utility besides just being kind of fun uh, in that, uh, you know, I think there's, where was it? Well, there's, you know, you can see there's big trees and stuff that might get in your way of, of lower objects. Um, there's one big tree here somewhere. I don't see it right at the moment, but anyway. So there's landscapes you can put in Stellarium too, and I'll show you in a minute. You know, I put in one for my my home observing location, so I know when things are behind my neighbor's house or or my house or, or what have you. Um, let's go back to, well, no, this is fine. We'll just go from here. Okay. So then another thing. Uh, so so I want to make two points here. One is you know this is kind of orient you know, showing the sky for visual observers, right? So we can take the constellation lines away, we can put the constellation lines in, we can take the constellation labels away, you can label stars and deep space objects and all of that. Um, so this is kind of a, a good uh, visual approach. And then the other thing, I talked about how this is a full-on uh, planetarium, like you would go to a planetarium and, and see a show, is uh, I also did some some scripting with their scripting language, which is basically just JavaScript. So, for instance, for last night's uh, armchair star party, uh, you know, we got people oriented in, in the sky, pointed at uh, Polaris, uh, and then we said, well, what if we wanted to go look at M3? And so I run the script, and so this this slide that came up here is actually part of the the animation and it's showing inside Stellarium, right? So we talked about M3 and here's the finder chart, blah, blah, blah. And then I can, uh, when I'm ready, I can press a button and, uh, you know, it'll actually, you know, put some text up. Uh, I've got it, you know, it goes to the constellation, then it goes to the object, and then it zooms in. Um, and, you know, this again is a SJAA image, right? Take the stars away that so that, you know, I can manually put them back here for a minute. So see the stars are all lined up, but they kind of, some of them uh, bloat some of the stars in the image, so it's not super attractive. So take the stars away and there's, you know, PJ's beautiful image of, uh, of M3, right? And then... Uh, can press a button and show another slide, talk about the image, whatever. Uh, press a button and zoom out. Um, so it just, you know, there's a there's a, a ton of stuff you can do. Uh, you know, there's a Messier Marathon script that comes with it and just all kinds of really cool things that you can do with the, with the scripting language. Um, so that's all I wanted to say about about Stellarium for for visual. So let's go ahead. It's uh, let's start moving now over towards the telescope. So uh, just to get oriented here, uh, first I want to look at my all sky camera. So let me get back on the YouTube over here. I don't know if this is going to show on the YouTube or not, but there's the Big Dipper right here in my All Sky camera, and you can see it, uh, you know, pointing over to Polaris. So that gives you kind of an orientation. You know, this way is north, and this uh, palm tree is sort of southish. Uh, so that's and the good news is. The reason for the all sky camera is there's no clouds in the sky, just this big street light over here. Oh well, um, I can brighten this up a little bit. Uh, I think, yep. Yeah, oh yeah, so you can probably see the Big Dipper better now. And there's some other light 
action going on and so we'll see planes and stuff come across here but this is up on my roof and so I can see when there's clouds and stuff um, but let's go ahead and jump over to the to the telescope okay so this is my telescope computer and here we have Stellarium yet again but it looks a little, really different now right so you know the constellations are gone the constellation lines are gone and now we've got this grid pattern here what's going on with that so you know this is the the right ascension the ra and declination deck uh grid that's important when you're when you're imaging and and for finding things according to their coordinates and then there's a couple other lines that are important to me um I see M3 has gone across the meridian here, hopefully. Oh, I haven't slewed yet. Okay, that's all good. Uh, you know, this line here from north to south uh, through the zenith, through the highest point in the sky, is the meridian. So I need to know about that when I do meridian flips. And uh, I also need to know about this equator uh, here uh, for, you know, the best... Uh, calibration of, of the auto guiding software you're supposed to do it with in this square right here sort of one hour of uh, RA and 10 degrees of DEC uh, from the intersection of the meridian and, and the equator so that's why those lines are there and why they're bright uh, colors and, and whatnot and then you can see uh, you know this is my neighbor's house and uh, my house is over here we can turn the landscape up a little bit uh, so you can see that yeah okay so I have I have a pretty good uh, view um, other than my neighbor's house being you know like literally six feet away from my telescope but what can you do um, so this is the the Stellarium, and uh, you can see here this orange reticle is is representing where my telescope is pointing, and that's because of this mount driver uh, EQ mod talking to Stellarium. So, you know what you can do with that is pick some object in the sky. So, for instance, we can click on M3 or search for it and go to it. Right. So. My mount is unparked. It's not flashing that it's in park mode. And uh, I'm probably going to hate myself for doing this, but just so we can have the fun of watching the, the uh, mount move, I'm going to put this camera over here. It might mess with the audio a little bit, and it might not even work. OK. That's not going to work, so we'll just get rid of that. But I do have a camera uh, pointed at the at the telescope that sometimes works. All right, so what we do here is we say Control-1 for the first telescope. And you can see the telescope is moving, and I can hear it uh, through my open office door uh, moving. And it's going to come over here to M3. OK, and we can do things like center on M3 and zoom in. And there's uh, PJ's picture of, of M3 again. And you'll notice the telescope isn't pointed quite right and that's just again the you know inaccuracies of, of everything but we're going to fix that uh, when we get a little deeper into this uh, let me see my notes here what I want to go to next is uh, I usually um, sort of warm up uh, the software before it all connects together so the next thing I do is I go into the auto guiding software and uh, I see here that I've already connected uh, connect the uh, image or the, sorry the guiding camera and the mount driver so that's all good and then we can actually start taking images through that 
guide camera. So that's what that looks like. And just to prove that we're going to be able to guide, well, actually, I can let it pick the best guide star. It likes that one. And I've, one of the advantages of having a, a semi-permanent setup is, you know, you don't have to recalibrate PHD2 every time. So this is calibration from, you know, a week ago or so. Um, and so we're, we're already auto-guiding. Um, but we're actually going to, we're not completely on the target yet. So that was just to, to prove that things were going to work right. So I'm going to stop that. Okay, uh, and then let's go on to the last piece of software, which is Sequence Generator Pro. So a lot of stuff going on here. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of little widgets. These tools around the edge are, are widgets. And uh, you can arrange them differently and decide which, one, decide which ones are important to you. Uh, th th this is just the setup that, that I use. Uh, you got some histograms here and some statistics about the, the images as they come in. Uh, here you can control the size of the, the image that you're looking at. Um, I actually don't look too much at this section here, but this is supposed to be a, a high-level view of what's going on. And uh, then over here, we have a graph of the number of stars and that are detected and their uh, quality of focus. And there's a widget here for the uh, real-time focusing, which I'll show in a little bit. And then we have camera temperature. My camera temperature is currently minus 20 degrees, which is what I asked for. And it's uh, using 69% of the available cooling power to get to that, that temperature. So that's all good. Uh, this is the focuser position and temperature and all the controls around the focuser. This is uh, a graph that will show what PHD2 is doing in terms of how the quality of the, the guiding. And this widget is telling me which filter is in position. And then um, this one's at the bottom because I'm not currently using it. This used to tell me uh, my local weather conditions. Unfortunately, uh, Weather Underground stopped the, uh, the API for that. So unless I write something myself, that's uh, not working anymore. But that's not uh, critical. So that's sort of the stuff around the outside. Um, then you have a, a control panel with tabs for each of your uh, types of gear, the camera, the filter wheel, the focuser, the telescope, meaning the mount, uh, plate solving, uh, auto guiding, and miscellaneous other stuff, which in my case would be the rotator. Okay, and then this window here, which is always seems to be in the way of everything, is the, the sequencer. So this is where you plan out, you know, here's my, my M3, and I want, uh, you know, three events, a red, a green, and a blue. And I'm, for live stacking purposes, I'm just going to do 30-second exposures. But obviously, you would do longer exposures. But um, I'm just going to take a bunch of them forever, basically. Uh, so that's where you do that. And then here is where you connect just like in, in PHD2, where you connect the different pieces of equipment. Um, my uh, do-it-yourself rotator, the electronics are actually not on the telescope right now because I'm in the middle of moving them from being on the focuser to being on the, the telescope uh, to, to have them be less in the way. Um, so right now, if I want to rotate, I can use this manual rotator which is that thing where, you know, it tells me move it five degrees and I run out and move it what I think are five degrees and run back in the house and do that thing. Uh, and then up here, you've got your mount and your focuser and your filter wheel and your, your camera. So that's where you connect that stuff. Okay, uh, so one thing I wanted to, well, let's, let's do this sort of semi-manually here. So let's, uh, let's get on our target first. So I'm right clicking on my target and I'm going to say center on target. 
center on target M3, yes. So what this is going to do is take a picture of the sky uh, right where we're pointed. And then it's going to compare that picture of the sky where we're pointed to a database of pictures of the sky. And this is sort of mind blowing. Figure out where in the sky we're pointed to a high degree of accuracy. Okay, and it's going to happen really fast if things work good. <laughs> and if things don't, then there's a there's a failover uh, method. Um, so here's this little plate solver piece that comes free with uh, SGP from plane wave instruments. And it's going to start and it's done. That's how fast it is when it works. Um, so now uh, SGP knows uh, where we were in the sky, and it's going to tell the mount and the planetarium, hey, you said you were pointed at M3, but you were actually off by uh, 1,154 pixels in RA and 905 pixels in deck. Get your act together. right? So the mount driver is going to update its model of the sky, repoint the telescope to where M3 should be. And then the process is going to repeat until the error is less than a user specified value, which in my case, uh, I think is 50 pixels, if I remember. Oh, yeah. Total error. Anyway, yeah, I think it's, oh, here it is down here, 50 pixels. Yeah, 50 pixels. But you can see that we're dead on M3 already, right? There's M3, a globular cluster. Uh, and in fact, yes, we have success. So that's that's plate solving. So that's the first thing. Now we're dead on target. And if I go back in here in Stellarium, and I can turn those stars off so you can see better. Yeah, see, we're right on uh, M3. Okay, so that's all good. And we're uh, tracking with the mount. We haven't started auto guiding yet, but well, actually, we can do that now. Let's do that. So again, can start taking exposures with the auto guider. Going to let it pick a star. I can brighten the display up a little bit. OK. And by the way, the stars uh, look funky in here on purpose because of that on ag uh, autofocus system. And that's a little more detail than I want to go into right now. But the, the funny shape of the star is actually caused by astigmatism. And it uses, it's there on purpose to figure out when it's, when it's in focus and, and when it's not. Let's leave, it, let's leave it at that. So we'll start guiding and go back over here and i want to demonstrate one more thing in sgp before we actually start sequencing so again you know normally i use this focus lock thing but i just want to demonstrate what a sgp autofocus run looks like so we're in the control panel here we're going to go to focus and uh, we're going to see i have use autofocus unchecked but i'm going to click run just to run it manually So it's going to give me a, a graph here. And on the x-axis are positions of the focuser. And on the y-axis is the half flux radius, which is a measure of the quality of the focus, lower being better. And uh, you can kind of relate this to the, you know, two would be the, the two arc seconds. So if we get to two or below, we're, we're you know, getting good amateur quality scene. So what this thing is doing is it, it, you know, pushed the focuser out away from where we were by a certain amount, and then it's going to walk it back in, taking an exposure at each step, and we should get a nice V curve, right? So it's, it's out of focus. It's going to get better, 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 then worse, worse, worse. And it's going to then, uh, uh, plot a curve against that to predict even if the best focus point was between um, a couple of uh, be between two step points it's going to predict the the absolute best uh, position um, 
looks like it's kind of waiting for the auto guider here uh, to do something. So I think I'm going to just stop this for the moment here and not worry about that. And I might have to restart the... Let's... Oh, there it goes. Okay. Well, yeah, it's confused because I stopped the auto guider, so we're going to cancel that and start over. All right, one more time. This is one uh, aspect of uh, something you want to consider in your in your imaging acquisition software stack is how well does it recover when something goes wrong? Uh, and of course, they all try to be bulletproof. Um, and it's still waiting for the guider. I don't know why it's doing that. I have something in here that's telling it to use the auto guider. Well, I may have to bail on this part of the uh, demo here. have to try it with a brighter guide star here that I manually pick. Yes, that bright one is too close to the edge. Try this one more time. We are live, folks. <laughs> Some of the frustration of astrophotography. Um, I think the other way to handle this would be to go in here and change our rules about auto-guiding. Um, I don't really have this selected, but let's just turn this up for a minute. Okay, run. One more time, and then we'll move on. Okay, this is moving a little better now. So see, we're starting to get this V curve and we're gonna start, you know, the program will start plotting a, a curve against it here. In a, point or two more. Yeah, I, you know, Rob, I, I'm looking at your notes in the chat and uh, I figured you would set me straight here. Uh, pause and auto guider during focus, yeah. So it looks like our scene is not as great as, uh, you know, two, two arc seconds, but it's pretty good.
Okay, so again, it, so it, it's plotting this, this curve to figure out where the best point is. So it's actually going to repeat that process because it wasn't super happy with it. But anyway, that's the the autofocus routine that's in um, SGP. So I just wanted to show that before I do my normal thing, which is because not everybody's going to have this on egg stuff um, before I start this whole process. So um, connect all. So this is also looking at that, as I said, the shape of the guide star. And if you look over here at the, you probably can't see it because the font's too small, but this focus, current position focuser is now starting to be adjusted uh, by this real time process. Um, so that'll turn green and, and be uh, in focus and that'll just keep going the whole time we're imaging. So I'm not uh, even going to wait for that like I, like I normally would, but we can go ahead and uh, just start the sequence now. So I'm just going to click on Run Sequence. And it's asking me uh, if I want to start right now because uh, normally you would have this target marked as you know, slew and slew to it and start, and I have it off right now because we manually uh, got on the target ahead of time. So I'm saying yes, I want to image from here. So now it's actually so now we're imaging right, and again I'm I'm doing really short exposures because I'm going to be live stacking versus you know saving long exposures for for later processing. Um, so you know it it changed the filter to red. And it's taking a 30 second exposure. It's about halfway done. And in a minute here, excuse me, it'll pop up the first exposure. So there you go. There's an astro image. Uh, that's a monochrome camera through a red filter of M3. So I've sort of demonstrated all of the various bits and pieces that you have to put together to get to this point. Uh, it's now, um, again, as a as a option here for live stacking, I've got it set to rotate through the filter events versus take all the reds, then all the greens, then all the blues, uh, just so that we can get bits that we need to make a color image faster. Um, so now it's doing a green filter. That's the green filter, and now it's setting the filter to blue, and it'll do the blue filter. So the other thing I wanted to show then is um, the live stacking with Astro Toaster, not to be confused with Astro Tortilla, which is a plate solving program. So I'm cheating a little bit here because this this is <laughs> showing uh, live stacking results from last night uh, of these images that were taken last night during the armchair star party. But just to continue that same session, uh, monitor, stack, auto refresh, uh, and this is the progress bar here. So what this is doing is it's mo it's watching the folder where those light uh, f exposures are called lights, right? That we're that we're taking of our data. It's watching the folder where those are going into, and every time it sees one, it uh, stacks it in Deep Sky Stacker, and so you end up with a stack of reds, a stack of greens, and a stack of blue, and then it merges those stacks into uh, this color image that you see here. So here's our color image of M3 from a monochrome camera with filters. Uh, and, you know, these bottom ones here are from uh, tonight. You can see, well, you can't see, but I can see the date is the 24th 
right? So it's um, already created a red stack, and now it's working on the on the green stack, and then the blue stack, etc. So um, that's if you were doing uh, a virtual star party, a way to quickly get um, astro images up in in color is. Uh, live stacking with astro toaster and then there's other programs that will live stack but they're typically uh, just um, monochrome uh, images from a given filter okay bruce are you out there i am out here okay <laughs> are you in a position to uh show some stuff I am. Okay. Awesome. Uh, I'm poised to start uh, a sequence. Awesome. Uh, let me take your uh, screen here. Yeah. And um. So I should get my stuff out of the way work. here. Yeah. Let um, me give me a second to get my stuff out of the way here because I need to get I need to see the meat hangout meat so we can see you. Okay. Oh, it's already started to present me. Okay. Uh, so, can you see my Voyager screen now? I can, yeah. Yeah, let me uh, move my camera. Okay, less bandwidth for the camera now. Um, okay, so this is Voyager. Uh, I I have been using Sequence Generator Pro, um, like Glenn, for a couple of years. And um, and I have a love hate relationship with it. Uh, there are some things about it that I really love, and some things about it that it sometimes lets me down. It sometimes fails. And uh, I got I, uh, this software a while back when it was on a sale before they raised the price, actually. And uh, right now it goes for a little over hundred dollars. It's it's made by, um, as Glenn said earlier, a guy who. Uh, is in, in Italy and uh, he uh, he's in banking finance programming uh, so he like like Len said he can't fail and his software is uh, is basically built around the, the core concept of the show must go on don't stop uh, unless it's absolutely necessary and um, and it, you know I, I started setting it up about an hour and a half ago uh, I, I really actually haven't used it in like six months. I took a look at it about six months ago. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of people are using it to good effect. Uh, I see some really nice images coming out that have been created using this software. Uh, one thing I like about it is that it interfaces with other software that I have. For instance, uh, my mount is a software BISC mount. It came with a program called the SkyX uh, Pro, and that actually uh, always is running in the background whenever I'm running my uh, my Paramount MX Plus mount, uh, and it acts as a driver for the mount. But more than that, um, it has built-in plate solving that's really excellent plate solving. Um, it can handle cameras and filter wheels and stuff like that. Uh, and so Voyager actually interfaces with the camera part of the SkyX Pro and the plate solving of the SkyX Pro. And uh, it also uses it for its, uh, its sky maps, for its um, planetarium, they call it, uh, software. Um, so when it's looking for something, it looks it up in the database on SkyX, I believe. And it's, it will plate solve to make sure that it's on target and rotated. And, uh, and, and then uh, it actually also interfaces with uh, the guiding software that I use, PHD, uh, which is a free guiding software Glenn has talked about and shown you guys. Um, and uh, from what I can tell, having set it up over the past couple hours, uh, it looks solid. The more I look at the interface, the more I like it. And uh, this is kind of like jumping off a cliff. I, I did start a, uh, a sequence and then stopped it. Uh, I didn't want it to actually go too far, but uh, look, you know, there were a couple of hiccups that I had to figure out. 
but I was able to get it figured out uh, within a couple hours, which says something about the software and the interface. Um, so right now, all my gear is connected, as you can see here, uh, the SkyX camera add-on, the mount, the PhD guiding, uh, the planetarium part of the SkyX, the plate solving of the SkyX, uh, the focuser that is uh, going to be used is actually connected through the SkyX. Uh, it's a, a, a night crawler focuser made by Moonlight. Um, it's a really nice focuser. Uh, the uh, the autofocus routine that it's going to use is part of its software rather than part, part uh, rather than the one that's in the Sky X. It's going to use uh, part of Voyager to do the autofocusing, and it has a, a few different ways of doing it in Voyager, which is pretty cool. Um, and um, I have a flat device uh, uh, called a flip flat that acts as a cap at the end of the telescope. It's automated and uh, this software can open it and close it. And it actually has a built in light panel that it can light up at varying degrees of brightness so that you can do flat frames to calibrate and correct uh, deficiencies in your, your optical train, whether it be a dust bunny, a dust speck, uh, a, you know, water spot. Uh, or, or something that makes a, a spot on your image. Uh, you can calibrate it out with flat frames. Um, Glenn probably already went over that. Um, it also uh, makes up for the uh, deficiency that you sometimes have uh, uh, called vignetting, where you have light drop off around the edges of your frame. And with this imaging train, I do have a little bit of that. So it's good to do flats. Um, it also actually does, uh, you know, even finer, you would think that it would be kind of a gross, large uh, issue that it would be taken care of uh, when it's dust spots and things like that. But actually, it does more than that uh, down on the sensor level, from what I understand, as far as the surface of the sensor and the way that the pixels are set up, it, it can actually help take care of deficiencies there, too. So... Uh, Without further ado, let me see here. So uh, this this uh, tab right here called On the Fly um, is where my sequence is set up. And uh, they also have something called Drag Script, which I have not played with yet. Drag Script allows you to uh, somehow visually drag in different things. I, I guess maybe using these over here, you can uh, somehow set up a script on the fly by Putting, putting different parts of your sequence in there. But tonight I'm gonna to do uh, the on the fly part. Um, I actually plate solved on an image that I had done before a couple nights ago. I'm gonna be uh, imaging Messier 101, which is also known as the Pinwheel Galaxy. Um, so I, I basically uh, opened it up, solved it. Uh, we can do that again actually, just hit solve and it will solve it and it will ask me if I want to use it to to uh, populate the uh, target and I'll say yes um, I can go over here I actually set up my sequence with this button I have it set up to do red green and blue filters it's going to do uh, by slot which means that uh, it's going to actually do um, three of the reds, then three of the greens, then three of the blues, and then it's going to go back around and start over again. Uh, and it's going to do that 10 times. Um, it is uh, going to do 300 seconds for red and 120 seconds each for the green and blue. Um, and let's see, what else can I tell you about this? Um, basically, that's it. Uh, you know, uh, it, it, there are a number of different options down here. Uh, for uh, guiding and, and uh, stuff like that. And, and it will take care of that automatically, hopefully. So, okay. I'm going to hit this to start the sequence and run. It's opening up the uh, flip flat at the, at the end of the telescope. And it's pausing guiding if it were going. It's slewing to the target. Checking to see if it needed a meridian flip. It's already past the meridian. Doesn't have to do that. Uh, 
the way it's set up for uh, focus is uh, it's going to uh, glue to a star that's nearby and focus on that star and then glue back to the target. You can also do focus of a, a field of your image, uh, basically your field of view. It can focus on the entire field of view. I don't know what to do because it just says no data, but I'm sending data. Now it says excellent connection. We're back. Go ahead, Bruce. Oh. So your, your audio is breaking up. OK, we're back. Are we? We're back. We're back. OK, so it's just going through a focusing routine right now. Uh, sorry about the dropout, everybody. With what with the pandemic, a lot of people are using the internet more than usual, I guess, even late. Yeah, it's a long weekend, right? Sunday night, everyone's watching movies. Okay, so it's progressing through the autofocus routine. It does a V curve, just like Glenn showed you in Sequence Generator Pro. And uh, it is verifying that it got to focus. It, it actually got down to a uh, half flux diameter of 1.87, which is pretty good. Earlier, uh, when I was focusing, it was uh, more like three. So I thought that the seeing actually wasn't as good, but maybe it's starting to improve. Okay, so now it's starting the guider. It's um, going to use PhD, which I'll bring up so you can see it. Here is PhD. It's actually calibrating. It lowers the uh, the uh, exposure to one second for calibration, and calibrates near the target on a uh, a guide star that it selects automatically. Um, Usually, I I, uh, I calibrate uh, PhD myself, uh, and I usually go uh, to the southern part of the sky, to the celestial uh, equator and meridian intersection, and I pick a star there and uh, say that that's what I care. But you can also calibrate near your target, and so that's what it's doing, and it, it does it. Should be done in a few seconds. It moves the, the telescope up and then, and then uh, you know, or north and south and east and west. And how far to move the scope in order to move the, the star a certain amount uh, to keep it centered. All right. Now it's going south. It's almost done. And it's it's guiding now, I believe. Well, it should be. Let's see. I'm gonna clear this. Clear that. I guess it paused. It's not guiding yet, but it, it did the calibration and it will start guiding. Uh, when it when it's satisfied that it has plate solved and is back on exactly the right spot that it wants to be for my target. This is a lot like uh, ACP. Goes, so it's going to start guiding now. It selected that star, or at least it looks like it did. Yes, it's guiding. This is a lot like uh, ACP, ah, Bruce. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, it, it left it. Yeah, I haven't really got any experience with ACP. It left it at one second of exposure, which is uh, would not be my choice with this mount because it's not averaging the seeing. I'm going to try and manually increase that to maybe four seconds. And hopefully it won't do that I did that and uh, <laughs> it won't cause any problems. It uh, looks like we're actually exposing my first exposure of my sequence in the background there. And 
there. Okay, so now four seconds of guiding. And the thing about that is because your your star image is moving around because the seeing the uh, the atmosphere is kind of fluctuating and distorting the star image that you're seeing. Um, so by doing a longer exposure, you're averaging the position of the star and getting a more accurate location of the reality of where the star is over time. And my mount is a, is a decent mount and uh, it's generally tracking in the way that it's supposed to be tracking. So if you, if you try and adjust all the time to where seeing is going by having a really short exposure, like one second, uh, you're actually bouncing the mount all over the place when in reality, the best thing to do is to keep the mount in the same spot for a while and see what the average is rather than to go after where it looks like it is at any one second period of time. So they call that averaging out the seeing, averaging the seeing and, and it's uh, actually pretty good at a four second exposure. It looks like about a half. Hey, Bruce, can you uh, hear me? You know, 0.47 arc seconds. Can you hear uh, me, Bruce? Yes, uh, yes I can. I think your screen. Yes, I can. Yeah, <laughs> I think your screen is frozen for me, because uh, we're just showing like you're about to click on the four seconds, and the graph isn't moving. Uh, I think the only thing I can do about that is dump out of the meat and come back in. Uh, so um, let me try that. So we'll pause for a minute while I do that or you could try that <laughs> you want to go back I just and... uh yeah I you just... stopped presenting can you hear me glenn yeah i can hear you go can ahead you hear me? yeah yep. go bruce we can hear you anybody <laughs> go ahead and and pre uh, try presenting I, I tried uh i tried to stop presenting uh-huh um, i'll try restarting presenting perfect and we'll see what happens. Yes. Okay. How about now? It hasn't started presenting yet. Can you guys see me? We can, can you see the uh, screen? Uh, I can. No. Hmm. Not yet. Okay. So can you hear me, Glenn? I can hear you. Yes. Uh, okay. So it says the. Uh, Sorry, an error has occurred when screen sharing and uh, can't share my screen, so dismiss. So I'll dismiss it. Um, I'll stop sharing. I'll try again. And um... it looks like it's going to work. Okay. Are you guys? Uh... Are you seeing my screen now? Now we see it, yeah. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. I have a good Wi-Fi signal here, and uh, yep, we can it see should it. work. So uh, I updated the uh, the guide exposures to four seconds, and I see in the monitor, it's kind of like a log, right? And you can see that it updated to 4,000 milliseconds as a guiding parameter change. So you you can manually do that. And I, I would be surprised actually if, you, if there's not some place in here where you can tell it that you want to have longer exposures in general um, and uh, have it do that. So let's take a look at my sequence, if I can. Here's the sequence. Um, we lost not sure your, how to bring it up. We lost your screen uh, again, Bruce. Can you hear me, hmm. Bruce? Yeah. It's like yeah, I can presenting. hear you. Okay, it's like you're not presenting. Um, well. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna reconnect to my uh, my remote here too um, because that froze up for some reason. Sounds like maybe I should uh, extremely try local. reconnecting to the meet. <laughs>
Yeah, you can try that. Extremely local network uh, <laughs> issue <laughs> within your office there. Yeah, whatever you want to try, and huh. and uh, we'll okay. we'll try it once, and if that doesn't work, we'll we'll call a call it a night. Uh, any questions while we're mm. while Bruce? Um, I can put my camera up here. No, there's just only one comment that the screen is really blurry, but it is moving. Yeah, we. That's a problem with. Uh, uh, you know, software that's designed for. 1080p and then small fonts and then you run it through compression and put it through YouTube and <laughs> yeah it makes it makes it rough um, maybe we can think about some sort of screen magnifier uh, mouse thing that would let us zoom in on on stuff uh, yeah that's a great idea and for, yeah. for some of the folks that are on on the feed that are still on the feed you could try raising your quality on the on the YouTube as well yeah, I, that will help. That's one of the things that yeah we talked about uh, last night was you know setting your YouTube to to dark uh, mode and uh, getting the highest quality that you can uh, helps with the visibility. But yeah, I understand the fonts are really small in these Astro programs. Hey Bruce, we can see you. I don't hey. hear you. Oh, there you are. Uh, Hey, uh, I uh, so I use a uh, firewall in in Mac OS called Little Snitch, and I think it might have interrupted something here. So let me see if I can allow. Um, it snitched allow on you. Connections via Chrome. Yeah, seems that way. Okay, well maybe that'll do it. Okay, so let me try presenting. And let me try reconnecting this. Hmm. And that's nothing new. Usually it usually only takes a half a second for that to clear. So, you know, I have I have been having some network issues. Uh, normally, I would be using a router that's out on our back patio. Basically, we keep it in a uh, solarium, uh, like a sunroom back there, and uh, it just runs in that sunroom and hasn't been a problem until today. Uh, at which point. I think it got too hot. <laughs> it's a little warm out uh, today. It was a little warm out today, and that caused a problem. So anyway, here we are. Um, it looks like it's exposing. Uh, let me see if I can go to the sequence. I don't know if it's going to let me view the sequence itself. I'm not positive how to get there. I can try this. Um, so that's the configuration for the sequence, but it doesn't actually show me the progress of the sequence. Um, this is new software to me. So this box down here, if you guys can see my, my cursor um, on the right, labeled sequence, start, remain, end. Um, that's ba basically all the information that it gives me. Uh, what I can do, other than, you know, I, I can see the, the scrolling, the, uh, the log that's going by here with, with everything that's going on. Um, but there is another part of, uh, of Voyager called the Fit Viewer. And actually, I already have it running back here. So let's take a look using their fits file viewer and see if I have something that we can look at that has come in through that sequence uh, would be 
red images, I guess. Those are flats that I did earlier. Um, okay, so I have two reds. And there's my first image of M101, one single red. Uh, could be sharper. I guess maybe the the uh, the seeing isn't that great. It's three point four four HFD. Um, is that stretched in some way? This or? is this is yeah. I think that it's an automatic screen stretch. Um, I don't know how to uh, turn off the screen stretch. Maybe it's the raw show raw without any stretch. There. Well, we I guess okay, yeah. So the, that's unstretched. Yeah, the top histogram is and, unstretched, and the bottom one is stretched. Then I guess. There you go. So this is a, a uh, Pix Insight nonlinear auto stretch, and uh, I don't know why these are these two buttons. What what the difference is? Low level nonlinear uh, Pix Insight auto stretch. So anyway, uh, cool. Not bad. Not bad. Yeah. Uh, there's a little bit of vignetting in the corners, as I mentioned. I have a little bit of vignetting in this in this image train, but uh, it'll correct out with flats, and I'm on my way to a, a good a good image, I think. Awesome. Uh, um, Anything else we need to cover? Yeah. Um. Well, I I think that basically covers it. Uh, it. You know, it it's doing everything the way it should. It's uh, and you know, it monitors my guiding. Uh, let's take a look at the guiding. Let's see how it is. It's really not bad. 0.8 arc seconds. Uh, RMS. Uh, maybe I could get a little bit better focus with the autofocus. Uh, I do have an on ag in there. Uh, I uh, I need to tweak the the uh, the settings in the onag a little bit. And decided not to use it tonight, um, but it is guiding through that. And one of the nice things about the onag, aside from uh, using focus lock for consistent focus all the time, actually is uh, it's using a, a cold mirror, I believe they call it, and it's splitting the visible light uh, off and sending that to the imaging camera that's on the side of it. And the light that is um, remaining is the near infrared light, and that goes through the mirror and to the guide camera that's on the back end of the telescope. And uh, the near infrared light from stars is generally less affected by the seeing. So it should be a more accurate uh, assessment of where the star is. Uh, you know, at any given time, which makes you, you're, it's basically correcting more for the fluctuations of the mount itself because of the, uh, the, the gearing and the worm uh, gear of the mount uh, having little bumps and, and irregularities in it that causes the mount to not be completely perfect for tracking. Um, so our guiding is really, uh, Essentially, the guiding is is there to take care of the inaccuracies of your mount. If your mount is perfectly accurate, you really don't need much guiding, if any. Um, having a more accurate um, position on the stars is is helpful because you're not making corrections that aren't real. Uh, I think that basically covers it. I, actually, I'm I'm really uh, impressed with Voyager so far. So we'll see how it goes. Okay, great. And we seem to be having uh, network errors on my my side popping in and out. At least this YouTube is complaining about the stream. So this is probably a good time to call it. Um, I think we've covered uh, all the material I wanted to cover tonight. And thanks to Bruce for... Um, 
helping out and doing a demo and taking a risk on demoing something that, that he's not super familiar with. I appreciate that. And uh, thanks to Rashi also for uh, helping out with the YouTube stream, keeping an eye on that. And uh, let me just go back to my PowerPoint here for the outro. Um, yeah, so uh, we've got uh, maybe five minutes and if anybody has any questions. And uh, if not, I'll go to the final slide. So we'll pause here for a second for the YouTube delay. If you've got any questions, this would be the time to type them into the chat window. And uh, after, uh, I'm going to, well, I guess if there's no questions, there's no reason to leave the, the chat open. But um, um, you know, you can put comments in the in the YouTube later uh, if you're watching this not in real time or otherwise. Um, we'd like your feedback. This is the first time for this slide deck, uh, and you know, I'd like to keep improving it. So your feedback is more than welcome. Um, I guess we don't have any questions at this point, so let me just go to the final slide. Thanks for watching. Uh, again, um, you know, we've got a couple YouTube channels there. Uh, we've got the uh, SJA uh, Imaging SIG program, the special interest group that Bruce runs. Uh, and we've got uh, the, the meetup there uh, as well. So those are QR codes you can point your smartphone at or copy down the, the URLs. So yeah, so thanks for watching and uh, we'll see you next month with either something similar or maybe we'll be out at Little Uvis. We'll have to see what, what happens with the whole COVID-19 thing. So thanks and we'll see you next month. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you, Bruce. Yeah, we're out. Thank you. Have a good night, Glenn. Yep.